if you get your views from television news you'll only hear stories that corporations choose you'll only get to see what they want you to see you're gonna have to read and decide what you believe we all watched in horror 911 the planes hit the towers and the towers came down did you ever wonder how they fell so fast well maybe that's a question that we're not supposed to ask hi and welcome to another episode of 911 was an inside job I'm here in the control room of Studio B because Studio A got preempted I forgot it's not a live show today so I'm going to show you all a series of clips to catch up on some things first of all we're going to show you the uh, uh, David Chandler third in the series of the uh, NIST series where he got NIST to retract their statement that there was no free fall got them to admit to free fall and uh, this is the probably the most important part of it where the importance of free fall the significance of free fall of building seven is is explained I spent a lot of time on the blogs lately arguing with people it's kind of strange to have to do that about principles of science that should be basic I mean basic high school physics well we're just gonna go ahead now and switch to this David Chandler video it's about 15 minutes long and then I'll be back with a Bob Bowman must-see video and follow that up with something about the economy so here we go um, and Take it away, Dave. Okay, part three of this series actually uh, is what I was intending to do as part two. This is going to spell out the implications of NIST's admission that Building 7 went through a period of free fall. Shyam Sundar is the lead investigator for the NIST analysis of the collapse of World Trade Center Building 7. In the technical briefing on August 26th, Dr. Sundar clearly explained why free fall for World Trade Center 7 was impossible. The analysis showed there's a difference in time between a free fall time. A free fall time would be an object that has no uh, structural components below it. And that is not at all unusual because there, there was a structural resistance that was provided in this particular case. And you had, uh, you had a sequence of structural failures that had to take place and everything was not instantaneous. That was before they were forced to acknowledge that free fall actually occurred. Once they acknowledged free fall, they claimed without elaboration that their new analysis was consistent with the results of the global collapse analysis. I'm not making this up. This is their own words. Free fall time would be an object that has no uh, structural components below it. Sunder's original remarks make sense under the assumption of a natural collapse. Anything at an elevated height has gravitational potential energy. If it falls and none of the energy is used for other things along the way, all of that energy is converted into kinetic energy, the energy of motion, and we call it free fall. If any of the energy is used for other purposes, there will be less kinetic energy, so the fall will be slower. In the case of a falling building, the only way it can go into free fall is if an external force removes the supporting structure. None of the gravitational potential energy of the building is available for this purpose or it would slow the fall of the building. The fact of free fall by itself is strong evidence of explosive demolition, but the evidence is even stronger than that. My original analysis looks like this. I have since confirmed my measurement using a different software package. Both of these graphs plot velocity versus time. A straight line indicates constant acceleration, and the slope of the line indicates the rate of acceleration. What is particularly striking is the suddenness of onset of freefall. The acceleration doesn't build up gradually. The graph simply turns a corner. The building went from full support to zero support 
instantly. This graph is upside down relative to mine, but that's really not an issue. Their data is almost the same. What is dramatically different is the curve they superimpose on the data. This curve has no physical significance whatsoever. It is merely a hypothetical interpretation of the data. It is literally the mathematical equivalent of laying a wet noodle on the graph and nudging it around until it fits the data. The straight part fits the data reasonably well. What is totally misleading are the gradual transitions into and out of free fall. The raw data speaks for itself. One moment the building is holding, the next moment it lets go and is in complete free fall. The onset of free fall was not only sudden, it extended across the whole width of the building. My measurement of the acceleration of the building was based on the northwest corner. And this recent measurement confirming free fall was based on a point midway along the roof line. The fact that the roof stayed level shows the building was in free fall across the entire width. The collapse we see cannot be due to a column failure or a few column failures or a sequence of column failures. All 24 interior columns and 58 perimeter columns had to have been removed over the span of eight floors low in the building simultaneously to within a small fraction of a second, and in such a way that the top half of the building remains intact and uncrumpled. Let's come back to NIST's acceptance of freefall. Here is their exact wording. Quote, the three stages of collapse progression described above are consistent with the results of the global collapse analysis discussed in Chapter 12 of NIST NC Star 1-9. In other words, they're giving the appearance of claiming free fall is okay, but actually it's the 5.4 second duration of their three-stage analysis that matches their model. But we saw in Part 2 of this video series that the 5.4 seconds depends on an artificially early start time, which has no valid observational basis. Without the 5.4 second fig leaf, they are left with free fall and nothing more. NIST does not show how free fall is consistent with their hypothesis, because, as Shyam Sundar has correctly and eloquently explained, free fall for a naturally collapsing building is impossible. This brings us to their computer model. This so-called investigation actually consists of finding a way to reproduce the mysterious collapse of the building using a computer model. The assumption is that if the computer model can be made to reproduce the observed collapse pattern, that must be how it happened. The problem is, if something unexpected was going on, like explosives for instance, you're not going to discover it in the computer model. For that, you need to look at the actual evidence. So why not examine the steel directly? Oh yes, there isn't any. At least there isn't any after it was hauled away to Asia and melted down. NIST's investigation has been compared to conducting an autopsy without the corpse. As of 2005, NIST reported having only 236 pieces of steel from the World Trade Center complex, none of them unambiguously identified as being from World Trade Center 7. We've all watched CSI. Anyone serious about solving a crime knows the importance of physical evidence. Yet here the crime scene was scrubbed, the evidence was destroyed, and the investigation was delayed for years. Destroying a crime scene is itself a criminal act. Destroying the steel has absolutely no justification except to cover up the cause of the collapse. So even if we knew nothing else about the events of that day, we can see immediately there was a cover-up. Knowing there was a cover-up is a strong indication there was a crime someone wanted covered up. Any investigation that does not acknowledge this basic fact is not really an investigation. It's an extension of the cover-up. NIST claims their computer model can account for the observed phenomena. So let's look at NIST's model. Except we can't. The software they use to do the modeling is available, but their model actually consists of all the numbers and measurements and assumptions together with any tweaks to the system they might have used to get it to come out the way they wanted. If that information were released, their results could be checked by anyone with the appropriate skills and software tools. But NIST has not released the numbers. All we've been shown are some of the selected animated outputs they were able to get their model to produce. Is their model realistic? We don't know. Some models are chaotic in the mathematical sense. In other words, tiny variations in the inputs might result in wildly different outcomes. Is NIST's model stable or chaotic? realistic or contrived, honest or fraudulent. We don't know. We can't know without independent testing. 
The very process of running the model until it produces the kind of result you're looking for is called selection bias. If you think about it, NIST methodology is explicitly based on selection bias. Even if you could show what might have happened, it doesn't show what actually did happen. The very fact that NIST has not released their model strongly suggests they don't want their results checked. In other words, their results are intended to be taken strictly on faith. If NIST has not released their modeling data and their assumptions, they have really not released their report. And the fact that this is their final report indicates they do not intend to do so. Therefore, on the face of it, their report is little more than a fancy, expensive cover-up. One fact we do know about NIST's model is it does not allow for freefall. The best they could do is 5.4 seconds for the building to crumple down through 18 floors. Crumpling absorbs energy, and that makes freefall impossible. There is nothing in the models we have been shown that even resemble a three-stage collapse with a freefall component. After all, as Shyam Sundar put it himself, freefall happens only when there are no structural components below the falling section of the building. Any natural scenario is going to involve a progression of failures, and these don't happen instantaneously. So, in the end, we come back to where we were in the beginning. On first impression, we were looking at a classic controlled demolition. NIST claimed to have found a way it could have happened naturally, but in fact, they failed. The only way they can support their claim is through lies, secrecy, and pompous but false pronouncements. That constitutes a failed agenda. Explosive demolition is the only scenario that has been put forward that could actually account for the observations. Where does that leave us? We have a building that underwent directly observable and now officially acknowledged freefall, with no plausible mechanisms other than explosive demolition. We have an official investigation by a government agency that has fraudulently manipulated data and has refused to even consider existing physical evidence that explosives were used. They have wrapped themselves and their data in secrecy and offered up pronouncements as conclusions to be taken on faith. The NIST investigation is a fraud and a farce. We need a new, fully empowered, truly independent, and open investigation. I've gotten a bit of adulation in the truth movement for having forced NIST to make this change, to admit freefall. And I want to set the record straight a little bit, but I also have some thoughts about this subject. First of all, it was not single-handedly. There were a number of people who submitted uh, requests for correction, is the term, in writing to NIST. I did, and several other people did as well. And um, Stephen Jones played a role right there in the conference, as you saw. So there, this was not um, just a single-handed anything. The other side of it is, I don't think that it's necessarily true that what I did there forced NIST to make this change. Because if you notice, Sham Sundar um, pretty much blew off my question. I mean, he talked all around it. Um, he eventually gave the rationale for why it couldn't have happened based on physical principles and so forth. But he basically could have just dropped it there and let it go. There are lots of lies in this document. And why not one more? Why did they feel it was necessary to come back and actually change their, um, their admission that it's free fall? Um, I've been pondering this. And one of the things that I noticed was if you look at the fact that when Stephen Jones asked his question, he asked, uh, why did you assume that it's constant speed versus constant acceleration? And in a sense, I, had, I noticed that same comment. I thought, it's hardly worth asking because it's clearly just a misstatement. Like, uh, it, in the very next paragraph, it says, I mean, there's an equation that's based on the assumption of constant acceleration. So it's clear that they weren't acting on a constant speed kind of assumption. That's just the word they used, and they could have changed the word and been done with it. But in the process of, the, of this conference, uh, John Gross talked about this for about a minute in which he talked all around the subject and didn't really address it. And somebody else eventually came in and said, 
uh, I think we'll have to fix this in the document. So in a sense, right there on film, they committed to changing the document. However, all they would have had to done, all they would have had to have done was simply change the word speed to acceleration and they would have fixed the document. Why did they do this complete reanalysis? That seemed over and above. I have a speculation and it's purely a speculation, but um, I, I think it, it has some merit. Uh, it, it occurs to me that somebody at NIST actually has some integrity. <laughs> Probably a lot of people at NIST have integrity and they, they didn't want to sign their names to this kind of a document. There's good scientists at NIST and they're being controlled by political hacks. These guys at the top, it's like the Bush administration on many occasions uh, overrode the science by political considerations and that was happening here. So the people at the top were determining what was going to be in the report and I'm sure that the scientists who actually did have integrity were chafing under this um, kind of a situation. And what I see as a possibility is that what uh, Stephen Jones and I did was actually create an opening and somebody at NIST picked up the ball and ran with it. This gave them an opportunity. They had committed to do a change and this was their opportunity to actually do something real. And they put in the change. Possibly, I don't know for what happened, I don't know the internal dynamics, possibly John Gross got pulled off of the committee or something that was doing this, or something else. I'm not really sure all the players and the roles they took, but somebody did something there. I just want to address this fact. There are good people within NIST who need to come forward. We need Daniel Ellsberg type people in this situation to come forward and make themselves known and make what they know public because this is what it's going to take to really break this thing open. We can point out flaws, we can point out the obvious, we can point out the physics and so forth, but what it's going to take possibly to actually get some action on the 9-11 truth to actually see justice done is to have people who know what happened uh, come forward and tell what they know. Okay, now let's see how many people are going to argue with that on the blogs when we take care of it, uh, when we check it out again. Anyway, take a look at uh, the end here of my show and you'll see my email. Um, you can email me at 911WAIJ, that's 911 was an inside job, uh, at gmail.com or you can use the 251 Omega at Comcast.net, whatever you prefer. And let me know what you think of it. Well, right now we're going to go into the Bob Bowman video, and Bob Bowman was a retired lieutenant colonel. I had his, a speech of his called Treason, where he labeled the 9-11 event as treason. Well, as usual, Bob has something good to say. If you don't know anything about Bob Bowman, he's the commander of the the Patriots. It's it's not a militia. It's a peace, peaceful, nonviolent group, based uh, entirely around the events that are happening now. And its membership includes a lot of military brass. It's it's kind of a hawkish thing, but you know, speaking as a liberal peacenik, they're hawks I can live with. So, without further ado, let's go to Bob Bowman. satellites would watch the world below, detect Soviet missiles blasting off, compute the position and speed of each missile, alert battle stations in space on Earth. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob Bowman, Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Air Force, retired. My Ph.D. is in aeronautics and nuclear engineering from Caltech. I flew 101 combat missions in Vietnam and directed all the Star Wars programs under Presidents Ford and Carter. 
when their existence was secret. I'm national commander of the Patriots, a nonprofit organization devoted to a government which follows the Constitution, honors the truth, and serves the people. For the last couple of years of the Bush administration, one of the main goals of our organization, the Patriots, was to prevent an attack on Iran. I even wrote a letter to the Pentagon in September 2007 reminding the commanding generals and admirals that their oath of office is to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Their oath is not to obey any order, no matter what. As a matter of fact, in the Nuremberg Principles, which the United States established at the end of World War II, we specifically state that soldiers of all ranks have not only the right but the duty to refuse an illegal order. And we executed Nazis who did the wrong thing, and their defense was they were just following orders. In that letter to the Pentagon, I told them that if Dick Cheney or somebody comes down to the Pentagon and says, go nuke Iran, they should not only refuse that order, they should arrest whoever gave it as a war criminal. Now that was 2007. Uh, here we are a couple years later, and Iran is still on the table. It's true that we have perhaps uh, folks in charge now who are less likely to go off half-cocked and nuke Iran, but their threat of military action is still there. And what's worse, we have the Vice President of the United States essentially giving Israel a green light to go do the dirty work themselves. And I think that's wrong. I think the word that we should be giving Israel, both publicly and privately, is if they initiate aggressive war against Iran or anybody else, that all U.S. aid for Israel will cease immediately. For the last 27 years, I've been a full-time truth-teller, and this has not endeared me to the establishment. Uh, I have been uh, subject to bribes, blackmail, death threats, FBI, CIA, and IRS harassment, uh, three audits in two years, and what for? for telling the truth. As a matter of fact, when I blew the whistle on Reagan's Star Wars scheme for attempting to deploy offensive weapons disguised as defense for the purpose of uh, regaining absolute military superiority and allowing the United States to execute a first strike against the Soviet Union, aggressive war, uh, a war crime, and uh, only lose 20 million Americans in the process. That was their definition of victory. Well, <clears throat> I, I did speak out against it, and most of that was at the specific request of Reagan's own Joint Chiefs of Staff. I'd been speaking out on Star Wars and telling the truth in bits and pieces and uh, briefing members of Congress and senators on what was happening. And in 1982, uh, 
several of my articles on Star Wars were published in the Congressional Record. But then in 1983, Reagan gave his infamous Star Wars speech in which he pretended to invent the whole thing. And shortly after that, Reagan's own Joint Chiefs of Staff called me into the Pentagon and pleaded with me to warn Congress and the American people about this military lunacy. And that's their words, not mine. You see, there was a gag order imposed by the Reagan administration on all military, all on active duty, and all those who retired during Reagan's administration. The only reason they had no hold on me was because I retired before Reagan took office. So the JCS said, you know, Bob, you directed all the Star Wars programs. You know what's going on. Very few people in the world do. And you can tell folks. Uh, they pleaded with me also to warn uh, the senators about what the Reagan administration was planning on doing with the shuttle. And that's testing Star Wars weapons, weapons designed to be fired from space against targets on the surface of the Earth, hitting them without warning, destroying hard targets like missile silos and command bunkers totally without warning. They wanted to test this out of the space shuttle, and the JCS thought this is going to confirm all the fears of the Soviet Union that the shuttle is just a weapon. So I did. I went to Congress and told the story, and I gave over 5,000 public lectures against Reagan's Star Wars speech. Uh, there were a lot of great adventures at that time. One of the, those speeches was in Moscow, where I debated Star Wars against uh, U.S. Ambassador to the Soviet Union, Jack Matlock, who had been one of Reagan's chief arms control negotiators. And uh, after I devastatingly convinced everybody, including Matlock, that uh, Star Wars would be absolutely useless as a defense against a Soviet attack, he admitted that, but said, wouldn't you like to have Star Wars if uh, Gaddafi got the bomb? And I said, no. If I was a, a, a terrorist or a rogue dictator and finally got my hands on enough plutonium to make a homemade bomb, the last thing in the world I would do would be to start a 15-year development program to build me an ICBM. I would just float that nuke up the Potomac on a barge or fly it into Red Square in a Cessna. Well, the whole audience, 4,000 physicians from around the world, erupted in laughter and applause. You see, at that moment, Matthias Roost's Cessna was sitting there in Red Square. We had watched it the night before. I was probably the first person in Moscow to see it coming. We watched it circle three times trying to land, and then when the people cleared out of the way, finally landed in Red Square. And he stood there for half an hour signing autographs, uh, waiting uh, for the police to show up and arrest him. Later that evening, uh, again this was the night before my debate with Matlock, I was at the rooftop restaurant of the Rosia Hotel overlooking Red Square and there was Matthias Ruth Cessna still sitting there in Red Square. But in the background there were fireworks going off all around the city. It was Frontier Day. The Soviets we're celebrating the vigilance of their border guards. So you can understand where when I talked the next day about just flying their nuke into Red Square in a Cessna, uh, this was very interesting. To it was even written up in the New Yorker magazine. So Star Wars was the time I really came out uh, against uh, the establishment in a big way and became a full-time troublemaker and whistleblower. Uh, I'd had opportunities in the past. The first time I recognized that the government could lie to the American people was over the assassination of John F. Kennedy. I mean, I think that anyone who watches the film of Kennedy's head snapping back 
from the impact of the fatal shot and his wife climbing on the back of the car to retrieve parts of his skull. For them to believe that the only shots came from behind, from a lone gunman in the school book depository, is ludicrous. Just as ludicrous as someone who hears the BBC broadcasting news of the collapse of Building 7 20 minutes before it happens, and seeing film of that building, 47-story building, coming down in what appears to be a perfect controlled demolition of an intact building with no visible fires. To see that and believe the Bush administration's official conspiracy theory about 9-11. The difference is that in 1963 we still had some free press and almost everyone alive at that time heard about the grassy knoll. But by 2001 the corporate monopoly media was tight as a drum and almost no one has heard of Building 7, much less seen videos of it that absolutely prove that the stories we have been told by our government are out and out lies and physical impossibilities. Building 7 I often hear about. No plane hit Building 7. Why did Building 7 come down? What do you tell people? What is Building 7? Or what it was it Building 5 or the building that wasn't hit by the plane? Building 7. I have no idea. I've never heard that. We're in a situation now where most of the American people have been uh, hoodwinked by the big lies of our government. And a great many people who actually work in the government are likewise hoodwinked by those big lies. Some of the people who tell those lies even believe in them. Well, it's time that those of us who know the truth speak it out frequently and loudly we must convince the American people and people in our government and even the President of the United States that these lies and the evil deeds which flow from them are destroying this nation and that they must rise up, all of us must rise up as one and say no, no to the lies, no to the myths, no to the evil actions, no to the Patriot Act, no to the wars of aggression, and no to taking away our liberties given us in the Constitution. We must tell the truth because only the truth can preserve this nation and restore our freedom. Now having fought Star Wars for so many years and having succeeded in keeping weapons out of space, I've been very, very concerned about the expansion of so-called missile defense into Eastern Europe encircling the Soviet Union or what is now Russia. Uh, missiles in Poland, radars in Czechoslovakia, these, I don't believe, have a legitimate purpose in protecting Europe or anybody else from nuclear missiles from Iran. Russia, as bad as they are now, having backslidden from democracy, they have a legitimate concern about those missiles in Poland. And my hope is that Obama, who so far is letting this lunacy continue, will, and I've heard he's going to review the policy, and I certainly hope he does, because there are much better and cheaper ways and less threatening ways of defending against nukes from Iran. And I hope that Obama's review scuttles 
the missiles in Poland and the radar in Czechoslovakia. Yeah, I know, we've promised those countries money. We've given all sorts of uh, stuff to them in order to be able to uh, deploy those weapons. Well, give them the money, but don't deploy the weapons because they make nuclear war more likely and they do not promote our national security. Now, many who voted for Obama are shocked and saddened by what is going on now. Uh, I'm not surprised because we knew before Obama was elected that his mentor, his foreign policy advisor was Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, someone who comes from the old Chicago school that Brzezinski and Kissinger and all those folks had an inside track to Obama's ear. And so it isn't surprising that the chess game that Obama is playing is carrying out what Brzezinski wrote about years and years ago. We need to, again, reach out to Obama uh, and certainly to our so-called representatives in Congress who unfortunately don't represent us but the big money interests that feed them. We must reach out and say no to this chess game. Uh, it is dangerous. It uh, doesn't promote our security. It uh, weakens it, and it is only designed to support imperial aims, and those imperial aims are not for the United States of America. They are using the United States of America to promote an imperialism of these global elites, multinational corporations, and banks. We don't want to live under a world government of the corporations, by the corporations, and for the corporations. The United States must return to a constitutional foreign policy where we seek not to be king of the hill nor subservient to the World Trade Organization, but simply seek to be a sovereign responsible member of the family of nations, nothing more and nothing less. When I ran for president in 2006, I discovered that there was not much difference between conservative Republicans and liberal Democrats, that those on the far left and the far right had the same concerns, the same issues, the same problems with our government. Both love our country but fear our government with good reason. Sometimes the left and the right use different language to discuss the same things. But we're one people and we need to understand that we have been artificially divided for far too long. The global elites have divided us into Democrat and Republican left and right, conservative and liberal. They have divided us with hot button issues like abortion and gay rights and gun control and prayer in schools. And by doing so, they have given us the electorate, the illusion that we have a choice. When in reality, both the Republican and Democratic parties are owned by the same global elites. And on issues that matter to those global elites, they act as one. When it comes to conducting a war of aggression for an oil pipeline, there's no difference between Democrat and Republican. When it comes to signing a trade deal to drive down wages and increase profits of the corporations. There's no difference between Republican and Democrat. Remember, 
It was Bill Clinton who gave us NAFTA. And it was Al Gore, the hero of the environmental movement, who was the hatchet man for the Clinton administration to cram NAFTA down the throats of a reluctant Congress. This is not a party issue. This is not a left-right issue. The question is not, should we have big government or little government? The question is, who should government serve? And it should serve the people. And it hasn't been doing it. And it still isn't doing it. And changing from Republican to Democrat or Democrat to Republican is not going to change that. The only thing that will change that is the American people understanding the truth, understanding what's happened to them, understanding that their wages now are a third of what they were in the 1950s, understanding that they have been stolen from massively, not by the government in taxes, but by the corporations with overhead and profits. The overhead and profits of the, that the corporation makes on the back of workers is about 200 times what the government takes in taxes. And the American people, having been educated as to the truth, then have to rise up and demand and get a government that starts serving them. We need a change, and it isn't going to come from Democrats and Republicans. It has to come from the American people. The enemy we face is not a Democratic president or a Republican president. It's a global conspiracy. Yes, a conspiracy. Whenever more than two people get together to plan evil, illegal deeds. It is a conspiracy, and that's what we're facing. Uh, the, at the top of this conspiracy are a, a handful of ultra-wealthy multi-billionaires in the world. Some of them have been conspiring for more than a century. Their tools are the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderbergers, the Trilateral Commission. And they have tools in other countries as well. And then, of course, there are thousands of think tanks and entities which serve their purposes. Their ultimate goal is to get all power unto themselves and to enrich themselves beyond all reason. Well, most of them are already wealthy beyond all reason, but the more wealth the, you get, it seems, the more you want. And they're never satisfied. They want more. More wealth and more power. And this drive causes them to want absolute control over us, the people. That's not what America was founded to be. We were founded to be a government where the people are sovereign. And we must be that again. There's been a dangerous trend lately of uh, the government co-opting churches and their clergy and using them to push their nefarious schemes to uh, uh, round up the American people, especially us dissenters, and to get rid of us. What the clergy needs to do is to tell their people Number one, about the nonviolent Jesus. And if they just can't bring themselves to preach nonviolence, at least teach them the just war principles, which have been violated in every one of our conflicts 
through our lifetimes and tell your people that participation in wars which do not follow the just war principles are sinful and immoral and every bullet they fire is another nail in the body of Jesus. If you can't tell your people that, why don't you just take off your collar, put down your Bible, and get an honest job? The Constitution, and in particular the First Amendment, is the source of what we now call separation of church and state. It means that the state doesn't mess with the churches and the churches don't mess with the state. Uh, as 501c3s, churches may not uh, come out in favor or against particular candidates for office or particular pieces of legislation. They can't tell their people vote against bill number so and so. But at the same time, the government must not use the churches to set forth their nefarious schemes of control. This is totally against the First Amendment to the Constitution. All too often, we, the people, have been allowed ourselves to be manipulated by fear. Fear of terrorism, fear of economic collapse, fear of swine flu, for goodness sakes. And they have things that they want to feed us to cure these ills. And of course this means more control. We see in their solutions some horrible things. The uh, complete takeover of agriculture by Archer Daniels, Midland, and Monsanto, for example. Uh, in their food safety regulations which they want passed, they're going to practically eliminate the family farmer. And when it comes to animals, livestock, even pets, they want a national ID for all of those animals. And they want a small farmer who takes a, a cow or a pig to the county fair to show him, they have to fill out paperwork every time one of their animals leaves their property. Uh, they want to mate with the bull next door, got to report it to the federal government. Uh, they're making it impossible for small farmers to obey the rules and to own any livestock. But it's interesting, the big growers, the big livestock raisers, like Tyson Chicken, for example, are totally exempt from these new regulations. We must educate the people so that the people just pound the members of Congress until we get this kind of stuff killed. We can't afford to have the government and the giant agribusiness corporations taking over and eliminating all competition. One of the things Monsanto wants and is very near to getting is a global monopoly on seeds. If we allow them to make it impossible for farmers to keep their own seeds and reuse seeds year after year because they're fertile and have to use Monsanto's Terminator seeds which have no offspring, uh, then Monsanto rules the world's food supply. This is just one example of the ways in which this New World Order is designed to create corporate monopolies in food, in water, 
in energy, you name it, they want it. And if we allow them to have it, they have absolute power over our lives. I don't know how we're going to do it, but short of squirreling away a few live seeds, retreating to a mountaintop and barricading you from yourself from the rest of the world, growing your own food, uh, generating your own energy. And believe me, we've considered that for our family. Short of that, the only other option is to defeat these global elites, to prevent them getting these monopolies, and to return power to the people. I've got a large family, seven children, 21 grandchildren, four great-grandchildren. My wife keeps talking about having a retreat that we can bring them all to where they'll be safe and where we'll have our own water supply and grow our own food and generate our own energy with windmills and it sounds great. But if that's what we all do, we abdicate all power to these elites and they'll eventually come get us. We can't do that. We can't give up on America. We can't give up on the Constitution. We can't give up on the truth. We must come together and win this battle. We the people can win. We the people must win. Banning into space, a layered defense to protect the country from nuclear devastation. U.S. spy satellites would watch the world below, detect Soviet missiles blasting off, compute the position and speed of each missile, alert battle stations in space on Earth. Okay, that was Bob Bowman. Uh, you'll probably want to see that again. You can catch it on YouTube or at prisonplanet.com. Now, we're going to show another David Chandler video. This is called The L-Curve. It talks about the distribution of wealth. Dis well, not wealth, income. Now, wealth is another thing, and it will have a similar curve, but maybe even more accented. And who do we elect our representatives? I mean, which area of this graph do we elect our representatives from? Always the very, very rich. Why is it that only the rich people get to represent us? And then look at the legislation. Does it represent you? Doesn't represent me? Tax breaks for the very rich? Take away social services that helps people like me? Now, something's wrong with that picture. Well, watch The L Curve by David Chandler. Welcome to the L curve. This is a graph of the income distribution of the United States. Picture the population of the United States lined up on a football field, the poorest person on the far left and the richest person on the far right. The vertical scale on this graph is income represented by stacks of $100 bills. Let's zoom in and look at the family on the 50 yard line. The median income in the United States, the middle income, is about $40,000. That would be a stack of $100 bills about an inch and a half high. The majority of Americans lie along the horizontal branch of this graph. It's a long, gradual ramp from essentially zero at the far left to $100,000 at the 95-yard line. $100,000 would be a stack of $100 bills four inches high. At the 99-yard line, the graph rises to about one foot. This represents an income of about $300,000. When we get to the top one-third of one percent, one foot from the goal line, we hit the million-dollar mark. One million dollars is a stack of hundred-dollar bills one meter high. One meter is about 40 inches. From there, the graph rises sharply. As we zoom out, we see a tree on the left. This is the height of the giant sequoias, a pretty good picture of what $100 million looks like. 
The height of this frame is one kilometer, a little over half a mile. A stack of $100 bills one kilometer high would be $1 billion. Remember that a billion is a thousand times a million. A kilometer is a thousand meters. If one meter represents one million dollars, a kilometer would be one billion dollars. There are about 400 billionaires in the United States. It's hard to talk about income at this level because this kind of wealth doesn't come every month in a paycheck. This is almost, in, this is almost entirely investment income. Most people make money based on their labor. But money makes money in our economy far more efficiently than what can be earned from labor. As we continue to zoom, we see there is a mountain behind us. The sequoias don't grow in Nepal, but this mountain represents the height of Mount Everest. It's a good picture of what $10 billion looks like. We come now to the top of the stratosphere and the top of our graph. At the 50 kilometer mark, we see Bill Gates' greatest increase in net worth in one year. His overall wealth rises and falls with the stock market, but was reputed to be about $100 billion at one point. Other families have comparable wealth. The Walmart fortune, for instance, is shared by several members of the Walton family, but their total wealth is even greater than the Microsoft fortune. As we zoom back in, try to take it all in. The next time some politician talks about tax cuts, ask yourself whose taxes are being cut and at whose expense. Okay, that was the L curve by David Chandler. Um, we're going to now leave the show with the opening music video with the music by John Kellerman and the video sequence that goes with the music by uh, another PCM producer, James Rathall. My thanks to both of them for their work on this. So see you on April 2nd. Osama got his training from the CIA. Our soldiers took Afghanistan, they let him slip away. A new Pearl Harbor was their big chance to launch two wars that they'd planned in advance. Now we know they lied about weapons in Iraq. Did they allow the 9-11 attack? If you get your view, from television news You'll only hear stories that corporations choose You'll only get to see What they want you to see You're gonna have to read and decide what you believe <laughs>